in uh, Ghana. So we are live on Zoom. We are live on Facebook. My name is Angela Equia Asante, aka Triple A, and I welcome you to sports. And the topic today is the media coverage of African football, the challenges and opportunities. Um, I am uh, happy to announce that we are joined by Mohamed Abubakar, sport journalist as from CGNT Africa in Kenya, uh, Ellen Ingo, sport journalist in Cameroon, uh, Fentuo Tahiru, uh, my fellow Ghanaian from City of and City TV, and Yusha Kumugisha, African football correspondent on uh, Super Sports TV in Uganda. So hello everybody and um, before we begin I want to let you know that some of you may also be familiar with Africa Talk Sports but as we are welcoming you know some new audience members on Facebook and on Zoom I would like to quickly touch on the mission and objective of this webinar today. So basically Africa Talk Sports is designed to bring together and create a dialogue across the African sports world on how we can tackle opportunities and the major challenges that our sports movement is facing, not only during COVID-19, but on an ongoing basis. So the founder and managing director Yes. Okay. All right. So it looks like I have been muted. So I'm just going to go over again. Um, Africa Talk Sports is designed to bring together and create a dialogue across the African sports, um, you know, the African sports world on how we can tackle opportunities, um, the major challenges that our sports movement is facing, not just during COVID-19, but also on an ongoing basis. The founder of Africa Talk Sports and managing director is uh, Mustafa Sal, who is on your screen here. Uh, Mustafa Sal, just say hello, please, to the audience. If you can just unmute yourself and say hello. Hello to everyone. This is Mustafa. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for joining. Merci. Thank you. All right. Yes. Um, so it's, uh, he's the founder of Sirem Sports. It's uh, a newly established Senegalese agency specializing in sports, uh, international relations, and event management. So for those of you who are sharp, you will understand that S-I-R-E-M, Sirem Sports, actually stands for Sports, International Relations, and Event Management. Anyways, that's the reason why we are here today to discuss the following topic the media coverage of African football challenges and opportunities. And to debate on this topic, we have invited Mohamed Abubakar, Ellen Ngo, Fenshu Tahiru, and Usha Komikisha. So once again, my name is Angela Ikria Asante, aka Triple A. I'm your host for the day. And let's get right into the topic. So what I'm going to do right now is give the microphone to um, each speaker one by one, and they are going to introduce themselves uh, within two minutes maximum. So please, Usha, take the floor away. Thank you very much, Angela. It's always a pleasure to join my fellow uh, African uh, sports journalists to talk about uh, issues that actually matter on the continent as we try to continue to tell the African story every other day. Um, my name is Asha Komgisha, and uh, I'm a Ugandan multimedia sports journalist. I contribute to Soccer Africa, which is a uh, uh, an African football magazine show on Supersport, and I'm also a writer with uh, FIBA, which is really basketball. And uh, I also sit as an analyst on uh, local radio, uh, sorry, local television uh, station here in Uganda called NTV Pressbox. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, that's um, a lady wearing uh, many hats. Um, so now I'm going to give the microphone to uh, Fenchu Tahiru. Uh, sports editor from CTFM, CTTV. Uh, please take the floor away and uh, introduce yourself. Yeah, hello, everybody. My name is Fentua Tahiru. Uh, a lot of people get my first name wrong. Fentua, Fento, Fen like all kinds of things, but uh, that's okay. <laughs> Asha, are you guilty? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> <laughs> so yeah, my first name is Fentio. It's actually quite simple to say. I'm a sports journalist with uh, City FM and City TV here in in, in Accra, Ghana. Um, one of the biggest media uh, platforms in this country. Um, and they basically cover pretty much everything. If somebody's swinging a bat somewhere, I'm there. If they're kicking a rubber bullet, you know, rubber ball somewhere, I'm there. If, if people are running, I'm there. So basically, it's what we do. We cover people. We go around following people while they're having fun and making money. Isn't that fun? <laughs> 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 Thank you, thank you. Um, Hélène, bonjour Hélène du Cameroun, allez-y. Hélène's French is as bad as Hello. mine. <laughs> bonjour, je m'appelle Hélène Gros, je suis journaliste sportive à la CRTV au Cameroun. My name is Hélène, a journalist, yeah. sports journalist with Cameroon Radio Television. And I cover everything, football, basketball, um, athletics. I have bylines on um, world athletics. And yeah, basically that's it. It's fun, you know, talking about some of the challenges we face as um, sports reporters. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And lastly, Mohamed Abubakar from CGTN Africa and Kenya. Please introduce yourself to our audiences. All right, hello guys. Uh... Mohamed Abubakar from uh, CGTN Africa. I'm a sports journalist based in Kenya. I've been uh, working uh, with uh, CGTN Africa standing for China Global Television Network for the past two years, on to two years now. Prior to that, uh, I've also been a sports uh, reporter slash presenter in uh, two local uh, stations here in Kenya as well. One namely, uh, Ebru TV Kenya and uh, Bamba Sports. Um, I've been uh, into sports uh, journalism for about five, going into six years now. And it's been an interesting journey, starting from local, now working with CGT in Africa. It's been beautiful, uh, trying to um, improve on my reporting as well from local perspective and now covering uh, Africa as well. So I'm really delighted to be here and uh, to reunite with, Fen is it Fentio? I know. I'm, I'm, one of the, I'm one of the guilty ones. <laughs> Let me just say it here. I know, it's like I'm reunited with everybody. But I mean, just it's, so it's, like it's everyone, so for I, me, I, I'm... <laughs> for me, it's a beautiful reunion to be able to meet with you again. And uh, Helen, uh, we were together last year in uh, Doha, the World Championships. Uh, yes, and uh, for Mustafa Sal as well, thank you so much for uh, doing this. And for Triple A as well, and Asha, I have to say it's a pleasure to finally meet you virtually. <laughs> and I'm nice to meet to, you, Mohammed. <laughs> I'm looking forward to uh, a fruitful discussion and uh, to help each other improve on how we can tell the African uh, football story better. And uh, yeah, and hopefully we can have also some of the audience members contribute as well. So it's important. I'd like to think I'm not here as an expert on matters football management in general, but as media. We have to do our bit. So, yeah, thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Mohammed. Thank you to all the... I, Angela, sorry, I have to say yes. something. Um, yes. I'm sorry, but when Helen said she's covering athletics in Cameroon, Mohammed and I are very insulted. Which athletics is in Cameroon? Please. Okay, the athletics band is on this side. <laughs> the banter begins. We have the banter banter begins. Banter begins. <laughs> Yes, I was going to say that we do have a few um, very good uh, Cameroonian athletes, but Usha is going to have a point there. Mohammed is going to have a point there. Kenyan and Ugandan athletes, mm -mm. difficult to write about. <laughs> Anyways, guys, uh, a reminder that uh, Usha, uh, you're going to get yellow carded very soon. <laughs> a reminder that we are here today to talk about the media coverage of African football. Uh, its challenges and opportunities. I'm super glad to be in the company of uh, you guys because you are well positioned to offer insights on that. Mohammed was being very modest when he said that he likes uh, to think about himself not as an expert, but I think you guys are all experts in your field. And uh, one thing that you know the audiences can take a cue from is that journalists are super busy and have to multitask because you were all introducing yourself and you mentioned not least than two you know, media houses or two roles that you are into. So um, that's it. And by the way, uh, for audiences who wonder why 
I have Chamber for Tourism Industry written in the background uh, is because as journalists, we always multitask. And um, the, the news is that I, I was appointed on, um, in August as the COO at, at the Chamber for Tourism Industry Ghana. So here's another way of multitasking in our profession. Anyways, um, <laughs> thank you very much. Congratulations. Now we are going to go right into the, 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 the topic and um, I'll start with Usher because um, one of the first questions I want to ask and, you know, point straightforward is, here's the case, you know, there is later to no debate um, a database to serve up uh, important match stats. So before, you know, uh, we're talking about football now, right? Uh, not just uh, other sports, but specifically football. And the thing is, there is very little database to serve important match statistics. Uh, most of the information is either non-existent or it is unverified online um, or it is very scarce, you know? So as a journalist, how and where do you actually dig your match statistic information and what are your sources to inform your wide following? Well, first of all, um, coming from a basketball, cricket and uh, athletics, which is track and field uh, background, um, I find it so weird that uh, in the football sphere, which we consider as the number one sport on the African continent, there's not much data, you know, for us to cover the game. Um, even though it's really like, if you look at most of the countries, football is number one. Um, and, and so for me personally, what I've uh, developed over the years is to go back to the basics of journalism. You know, when you're covering a story, you need to speak to the people who are authorities on that mm -hmm. matter. And uh, if we talk about, okay, we're talking about data. What exactly are we looking for? For example, um, let's start with the simple basics. Who are the go uh, you know top goal scorers? So obviously, um, I've tried over the years to build um, uh, relationships with uh, uh, people that matter in those departments. So here I'm talking about um, uh, the heads of competitions of the different leagues on the African continent. So if you send a message or call or send an email to someone who is in charge of the league or in charge of the competitions, they're able to give you that information. Or better still, um, the heads of media uh, in these organizations. So I make sure that I have three options. So at least one, I have um, the head of competitions, I have the media officer of that federation or club, or even the coach or the player. Because sometimes uh, you also have to verify just one source uh, is not enough. So you need to, uh, if they tell you that James uh, Chamanga at the age of 40 is the top league scorer in Zambia, how do you verify that information? So I need okay. one to have at least even a, a top journalist in Zambia, then a competitions manager or the head of communications at FAS, the, the Zambian FA, or then the person who runs the league. So at least Three people can verify for me this information, one his edge, but also the number of goals that he scored. But sometimes these details are even more um, in depth. For example, how many, um, how many free kicks have been scored and converted in a particular league? Sometimes you, you don't have such information, but um, we're lucky you know, to, to have some countries like, for example, the Egyptian league. I know that there's a company called Cora Stats that does all the statistics in the Egyptian league. And I've been in touch with them recently to get me some of these statistics. But this is information that is not out there. You know, It's yeah. not, for example, like uh, uh, the Premier League where you just go to the app. If you want to compare a player, maybe Mohamed Salah and Sadio Mane, you, you have all their stats, right. the free kicks, the, everything is there. You know, yeah. We don't have yeah. that yet. Um, in Africa, even though, um, okay, no, not really at a, at a large scale. And even then it's, you know, the bigger leagues, you have your PSL in South Africa, you have your um, Tunisia, Morocco, Egypt. It's not easy for the other leagues. And that's a very big detriment for us as journalists, but, but we keep, we keep um, trying to get that information. And for me personally, that's what I do. I make sure that I have contacts of the people um, in those positions, in those mm -hmm. different clubs and the different countries, and that's how I'm able to get the stats. Fantastic. I think um, you, you, you're doing well in that sense because um, you know there's so much fake news going around and you want to make sure that you are cross-checking your information. 
But um, I want to bring this to your attention, Usha, for example. There was a time mm -hmm. when, um, I, I believe it was in European football, Cristiano Ronaldo had scored, um, if I remember well, it was in the Confederations Cup. And it was broadcasted in European football that he had, um, he had achieved, I think, a record um, in international competitions as a national team player. And actually, that record belonged to Ghana's Asamojian. Um, I think he had to equal Asamojian. And so the news traveled so fast, the Christian Ronaldo fan base, you know, with millions of people were just retweeting the information. And I believe it took, I believe it took Sadiq Adams in Ghana, a uh, from Ghana, please correct me if I'm wrong. But I remember Ghanaian journalists fact-checking the Europeans and saying, um, you know, putting the facts straight. But one of the reasons why this happened, in my, in my opinion, is because um, the, you know, the information was not being made available to even European journalists that, you know, um, for now, Asama John is holding this record. So how do you, how do you, you know, put that kind of information out there for, for it to be across board and not just African journalists going for the information and spreading it in, in the African media, but how do you put information out there for everybody to know that, you know, um, this is the fact and not spread false news. I remember European journalists apologizing and, and, and rectifying this, but more or less the damage had been done and everybody was thinking it was Ronaldo, but it was uh, Asama Jan. So um, Usha and uh, Fentua, if you can please jump into this uh, answer. Before sure. Fentua comes in, uh, yeah. first of all, I just want to say that congratulations to him. He's just been uh, appointed. Yeah, I hope appointed <laughs> as the head exactly. of sports at uh, City. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I say that uh, particularly because um, as the head of sports, you know, um, for such a big media house, he has a huge role to play. And that's why I'm, I'm, I want to talk before he talks. Um, why do I say that? In Africa, we have a, a big problem, really, because if, um, I, if I'm working in, a, and all, all of you can correct me if I'm wrong, but if you're working in a conventional newsroom where you have a sports desk, you have a political desk, you have a business desk, you find that uh, the sports journalists in there are about maybe four or five. And that's really to, to put it uh, outrightly. You know, Helen, I, I'm sure uh, maybe CRTV, you have uh, uh, a bigger number it's because it's a on. state broadcaster. It's <laughs> yeah, so you find that- oh, um, Not as much I'm, as I'm you think. think. <laughs> you know, so you find that one person is covering boxing, the other person is covering, uh, so they're covering boxing, basketball, cricket. It's almost impossible for you to, to be uh, very exact when you cover this sport. And you talk about, uh, Angela, you talk about European journalists, but you need to remember that, for example, when Mark Ogden was working for ESPN, he was just mm. covering the Manchester clubs. So his That's job it. is to wake up and, and go yep. to United yep. Training, then later on go exactly. to Man City, and that's it. Mm. That's it. So can you imagine the amount of information he picks every mm. single day? He mm. eventually becomes an expert, expert. on the two exactly. Manchester clubs, you know? And it's the same thing with the NBA. Each team has a particular um, uh, journalist that covers that team. So mm. no one absolutely is going to have more information than those guys because mm. they eat, breathe, sleep, mm. Toronto Raptors. That's mm. it, just one. You know, yes. and then yeah. you, you come, you know, you, Angela, first of all, okay, you're already with the, the Chamber for Tourism. Amazing job. Trust me. I love travel. Uh, but then if you have to cover the Blacksters, <laughs> then you have to cover um, the boxing. Then you, you cannot be an expert on exactly. this thing. You know? So that's where the problem is. But if, for example, I wake up and my job every day is to think about the Blacksters, I'm just going mm -hmm. to go back all the way to Babayara. I'm going mm. to to think about his story you know um read his his history read about uh for example you know all the coaches that have uh, that have a uh, jumpy charles jumpy i'm going to read about like everything you know and so i will have all these i have the luxury and the time to compile all these statistics even as a journalist i don't have to wait for the gfa you know to, to come to do up it with all these statistics, mm. yeah that's so, a good great point 
Yeah, so it's very easy, for example, that, you know, uh, Sadiq Adams is saying, look, I'm going to concentrate on Ghanaian football. And every mm -hmm. time the Black Stars step on that pitch, I'm going to be an expert. Okay, exactly. so recently um, I was trying to look at uh, how many, which player in Uganda is most capped. And I was shocked. It was someone I did not believe is the most capped player for the Uganda Cranes. And can you imagine, if you look at me, you think, oh, Asha is an expert on Ugandan football. Mm -hmm. But wow, I, I, until that point, I did not know mm -hmm. who is the yeah, most no, no. capped player mm -hmm. for the Uganda Cranes. Mm -hmm. So I'm taking it upon mm -hmm. myself in the next, you know, until the year ends, I'm going to dig mm -hmm. up all the information. But sometimes it's not easy. But thank God we're in 2020. There's a lot of um, mm -hmm. uh, software out there that mm -hmm. I'm going to try and compile, for example, how many mm -hmm. quick kicks have the Uganda Cranes mm -hmm converted in the last 10 years okay these are some sure. of the details that help you with uh, the analysis so mm. just to answer your question uh, before uh, fentio comes in um it, it's it's quite important that if we do something we have to specialize on that thing so that way be, because we don't have the luxury that the that the Perfect. europeans have True. we True. don't True. so so if you want to be um, the best boxing reporter in Ghana, you have to go back to the basics and literally study. Because yes. I remember when Sadiq did his, um, uh, the documentary, there's a gentleman, yes. I forget his name, sorry. There's a gentleman that um, uh, was, was his title on, on the untold God, uh, yes. the one about Babayara was, yes. uh, was Ghanaian football historian. Uh, do you remember that, Angela and uh, Fentio, the gentleman? Yes, so his, I remember. Yep, yes, yes. Yep, so yep. his, yeah, his role really is that he has studied the history of Ghanaian football, and he's hmm. an expert on that. So for me, I think it's very important for us really to uh, go back to the basics and and focus and and really really specialize on that one thing. We cannot be uh, a yes. jack of all trades. Mm. That does not help us if we're talking about uh, these statistics because it takes time and mm. a long period and commitment to, to achieve okay. that. Thank you so much, Isher, for your um, contribution. Um, I'm going to jump to um, Fentuo and um, cue in what you, you, the point you made about you know him in a position as a head of, uh, of sports at a big media house like CTFM, for example, you mentioned that um, one of his responsibilities would be to spread uh, the information and make it readily available because I made the link with, you know, European journalists of uh, thinking that Ronaldo had, um, had uh, you know, uh, achieved the record, which was actually belonging to Asamajan. So, um, so uh, yeah, Fenchel, uh, quickly in 30 seconds, how would you say that this can be done, like, you know, spreading the information and making it available to a journalist from outside Africa? Yeah, um, thank you very much. I think uh, Asha was very, very spot on <laughs> in that second submission about the struggles um, that you have to go to if you manage a sports desk. It's usually about four or five people. In my case, I have a desk of basically three and a half people. We were four. Yeah. Then the head of sports uh, got moved to a different department. And then I was made head of sports um, with two others. And then we have an intern. And guess yeah. what? Just those people, we run an entire media house that has a television station, that has a radio station, that has... Uh, a whole sports website just for sports, a website just for sports. And it's the same people that are writing, uh, that are doing radio coverage, that are doing TV coverage. So it's basically impossible. You come to Ghana, the 48 Division One league clubs, the mm. uh, 16 women league clubs, there are 18 Premier League clubs. There's the Black I Stars. See. We have national teams, eight of them. Like, it's impossible. That's And that's just football. If you go to uh, you know, the other sports, boxing is huge in Ghana, athletics is the same. So it's basically impossible. So on my desk, for example, and this is what we've done with the four people that we have over time, because we have not been able to have the luxury of having correspondence just for specific matches or specific uh, games or specific sporting disciplines, we've told everybody uh, what I have done 
is look at everybody's interest and where they show a lot of interest. So you look at the desk, you work with a group of people, you can always tell that this person has a lot more interest in football, that person has a lot more interest in basketball, or in athletics, or in mm -hmm. boxing. So then you start to assign them to more of those events. So on the desk, even with that defined roles, it is conversion uh, that when it is boxing, I know who I'm sending. And everybody knows who is going. If it is athletics, everyone knows who is going. If it's football, football is universal. It's big in the country. It's big in Ghana. That's that's pretty much everybody's life, you know, life or death situation at the moment. So that is universal. But the rest of them, which just naturally allowed people to pick the sports that they love, and then you start to assign them more and more uh, into those areas. So the more responsibilities you mm -hmm. give them in those sports and disciplines, the more they want to impress, the more they want to do well and become experts mm. in it. And I think that is working kind of nicely for my desk. Okay. Uh, in I terms of the data, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I should mention something very important about talking to people, the historians and, and, and speaking to the people who played the game. I'll tell you a very interesting story. And, and I'm sure Angie would remember, you mentioned it. There was a huge debate when Asamoah John broke the goal scoring records and everybody mm. said he was the top goal scorer. A former mm. Black Stars player, Asha, mm. came out and said he was the top scorer. Exactly. So now, there we were, the GFA had no records and this ex-Black Stars player, uh, who had played at the Africa Cup of Nations before 1978, when they beat Uganda, by the way, I'm sorry mm. to bring that up. Uh, but... Um, he, that's not important. Let's focus, please. <laughs> <laughs> so he comes out and he says he's the top scorer. In order to settle that debate, a group of journalists had to come together and go through the history, look at every single Black Stars game played since the Black Stars became the Black Stars. And then eventually we have to group the games you, because then you realize Immediately post-independence, around the 70s and 60s, a lot of the matches the Black Stars were playing were not when sanctioned games. Exactly. So all of those goals, he counted them, but in actual fact, they shouldn't count. We were only mm -hmm. dealing with FIFA-sanctioned friendly matches or competition games. But at the time, and, and you see, he feels hard done by it because at the time, they had the luxury, Kwame Nkrumah or whichever military ruler was in power, they had the luxury of camping the Black Stars for an entire year prior to an Africa Cup of Nations uh, tournament. So in that case, what they will do is play lots of football, lots of matches against club sides, against uh, you know, Division II sides, against other countries, out of the FIFA sanctioned window. So do you count those matches as well? So that is one of the challenges in, in talking to people who have played the game themselves about what they consider a match for the Black Stars or a match for a team and what they don't consider a match for a team. So it's very important to look at the parameters well and properly define them. So that was what we did, define the parameters, only officially sanctioned friendly matches and then tournament uh, uh, tournament matches as well. And that was how okay. Asamojan claimed the role of Ghana's highest top scorer now with 51 goals. Now in okay. the Premier League, for example, African leagues do not like to invest in statistic companies. And this is, this is, it's basic, it's fundamental. The, the numbers are not counted by human beings anymore. These numbers are done by sense. companies with experts. So I remember in the 2016 season, a group of journalists, a group of us with New Adams as one of them, Asha, you would know him. Um, we yeah. came together and then we decided that the Ghana Premier League the lack of data in the Ghana Premier League was almost criminal. It, it was almost it was almost offensive that nobody knows which goalkeeper has kept the most clean sheets in the history of the Ghana Premier League. Nobody knows who the top scorer is overall in the history of the Ghana Premier League. Nobody knows who's played the most Ghana Premier League matches. Nobody knows, um, not to talk about passes. These are just basic stats like goalkeeping, clean sheets or goals. Even that we don't have. So assess the same thing. So what we did was, and we had we created a WhatsApp group called GHPL Live, where every match day we had correspondence from every match day. And all of these people were naturally from the 
the, the, the venues where the games were taking place. They were not sent there. They, we found people who were from those match venues, who, was, who were from those cities. So that way they don't have to complain about money or struggle to travel. So we found people at every match venue and their job, and they're journalists working for other media houses as well. But we just told them, for now, let's start something. And we started with assist. That was previously unavailable. All they had was just goals for a season, and that was it. So we started with assist. So every match day, everybody on that WhatsApp platform, everyone was providing live data. Every goal scored, they just focused on who assisted the goal. Everybody would know the goal scorer. Lots of people mm -hmm. don't know who the assist maker is. Assist, exactly. So we did that, and now we are able to gather assists for Ghana mm -hmm. Premier League matches on the go live. And you know, at the end of the season, you can always tell who made how many assists or who's kept how many clean okay, sheets. Okay, great. And this is okay. something that the GFA has still not been able to invest in. Mm. And this is something that only journalists are doing, and I think it's working quite well. So um, I'm, I'm going to um, um, ask you guys to be a bit more brief, uh, otherwise we will, uh, <laughs> we could talk for a whole day, but we have limited time. Uh, so um, the next point I want to make is, you know, you talked about the challenges of having eventually, you talked about the challenges of having um, only three and a half people, for example, on the desk uh, covering so many things, uh, which um, more or less uh, correlates to the fact that at the end, we, we are not able to be specialized in something because one person has to do so many things. Um, having said that, one of the other challenges in media coverage of, of football, you know, um, in Africa is funding to cover competitions. Um, the, the, the point is there is already low marketability um, of the leagues, uh, which I believe creates a vicious cycle uh, because, you know, foreign leagues like the Premier League and La Liga have much more uh, impact, um, uh, you know, on, on the market. So, uh, but at the same time, of course, those are foreign leagues. So media houses in Ghana are not go or in the rest of the continent are going to send their they are journalists uh, in Europe to cover it. You know, they can just cover it from uh, from um, the comfort of, of their country and follow it and, and share the news. But the thing is, when it comes to African Football League, um, you know, is it challenging? Like, as people who work at media houses, uh, very different you have very different media houses. Is it difficult to get funding from sponsors or from your media houses coffers to travel exclusively for coverage? For example, um, if Ventral has to cover um, a CAF Champions League match, uh, are you sure if you have to do the same and travel you know, like out of Uganda? Is it one of the challenges that you, you face? And if that's the case, what could be you know, the, the solution to, to get funding and to, to cover leagues more exclusively? Uh, Fenchuo, please go ahead. Uh, briefly, please, because uh, our time is limited. Yes. Um, so we're talking about uh, coverage in terms of finding finances for it. Is that mm. right? And yes. uh, this is a big, <laughs> this is a big, <laughs> this is a big problem on the African continent. I'm not sure how that's like for someone like Asha who works for. Uh, a multinational media house but if you work for a, a local media house like in our case for example which is not state owned uh, and it's privately owned you know sports is always and it's funny because sports is always the last um, department to get any finances whatsoever to have sanctions for travel even though it is sports that requires a lot of travel all the time, the teams are always traveling and what have you. What I can say is that, for example, in, in our situation right now, it's basically impossible. You can't even justify to anybody, any media owner in this country that you want to travel to cover a club inter club competition if your club is not, a club from your country is not playing. Representing, yeah. Now, in that situation, even if your club is playing in it, like in the case of Ghana, it's interesting because it's not even the big media houses, and as you will agree, that get to send the reporters. It's usually the smaller media houses with good relationship with the teams. So what I have discovered, 
as a very easy way of being able to travel is to have a good relationship with the teams. So I take the okay. inter-club competitions, for example. If Kumasi Asante Kotoko is playing a match in Algeria, in Liberia, usually during their tribal um, arrangements, they give media houses that have a good relationship with them some slots where they are able to subsidize some of the tickets for them because they know the importance of media coverage for their team as well. Because without them, if they go there and anything happens, they need somebody, they need their activities to be out there in the media because you know the more media coverage they get, the more leverage they can get from their sponsors for their sponsors and what have you. So that is number one, having a good relationship with the entities. So if it is club football, if you have a good relationship with the clubs, they more than usual are always willing to subsidize airfare or what have you for journalists to go with them to cover games. Number two, I feel that it's much easier to get sponsorship to travel to cover a Black Stars match because it's nationwide, it has okay. national interest, and there's basically competition for content when it comes to the Black Stars. It's a massive entity, so that usually would pick itself. But even that, it can be a struggle. Now, what I have discovered, for example, that has worked for me in the past has been the ability to build a good relationship with corporate institutions. So if you do target coverage, and I say target coverage because it's very important to note that in the area of sports and the way we cover sports these days, I think a lot of people have gone beyond uh, Kotoko 1, Hearts 1, Black Stars 1, Craze of Uganda 2, or Cameroon 3, because that is data, that's information that is so easily available. Everybody can find it wherever they are. It, they can sit here, the AFCON can be going on. They will get the results from the AFCON. They will get to watch the matches. So why should you be there? If you can answer that question of why you need to be there, then I think that that is one step towards being able to justify to your superiors or to your sponsor that you deserve that particular sponsorship. Okay. So I'll take a good example. Uh, the last Africa Cup of Nations um, that's happening in Egypt, when we tried to get, you know, we, you know, you started to write memos like six months before, you know, it's important, City needs to cover the tournament, it's the Black Stars are in action, maybe this was our year, you never, every year is almost like our year. Every year is almost Black Stars year, so you never know. You, but what you don't want is to not be there when it happens. But then it comes to the, 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 mm. the basics. What is it that you're going to do? What kind of uh, coverage are you going to give the station? So in our case, for example, what really, um, you know, what really tilted the scale in our favor was the fact that for the first time, we were going to incorporate online coverage that wasn't just about writing much reports, mm. but getting content for a YouTube channel. Now, it's not just what's on TV, but also what we are able to put on the YouTube channel, which by the end of the AFCON, that YouTube channel had generated when I was at the AFCON, in that one month period that I was there, our YouTube channel, through the content that I sent, I generated more income than it had done in the, in the last six months. That was already value for money. Then you look at who paid for the trip. In my case, it was a sponsor that paid for the trip, mostly because that particular sponsor wasn't just going to pay for the trip for city's coverage of the AFCON. They wanted something more. So we offered something more. We said, okay, you know what? we can do social media coverage for, for you as well as us. So you give us your social media handles. We will cover the tournament basically for you. Our reporter will do his job, but we are basically covering this competition for you from a different angle that you've never had before, that you wouldn't get just sitting here or just giving the money to us to mm. cover the competition uh, on radio or on TV. Mm. That's what most, most journalists don't do because once the uh, company is sponsoring the media uh, the media companies coverage they go there they report for the media they go and sit on radio or tv and then they do their lpm they play their adverts maybe that is not enough maybe we need to look at what more we can do for these companies oh, from the okay. personal point of view beyond the money that they're giving us and then Fantastic. from the athletics point of view i covered my first 
you know, World Athletics Championships last year. That was when I met Mohammed and Helen. Um, uh, and that trip, for example, wasn't paid for by City, but I did the coverage for City nonetheless. So what I did was, at the time, I found a company that had been sponsoring athletes for a long time. They had been like, so you could tell where their interest was. This is a, an athletic, you know, company. They are just interested in athletics in this country. Mm. So I started to build a relationship from like a year back, you know, doing lots of reports. And, you know, for sports and disciplines like athletics or boxing that, you know, they don't get a lot of coverage in this country. Mm. And do agree with me, they don't. So if these companies who are sponsoring these competitions are getting a lot of media coverage for their activities, they always, they were more inclined towards me and they were more willing to share information with me. They were more willing to uh, take me to other competitions and always invite me to some of their events and what have you. So when it came to time and I said that I was going to go to the World Championships and then I told, I told them that, well, I, I don't really think my, my station or my company resources to go. They were more than willing to say, you know, um, you've done a great job for athletics and we are interested in what goes on with our athletes out there. So why don't we do this for you and then see what your company can do? Say they got me a ticket and then I just took the ticket to my company and they, all they had to do was give me per DM. And, you know, so it was much easier for me to go to them with a ticket and say, I have a ticket, now just give me per DM to go to the competition. Mm -hmm. It was much easier for them to say okay to that than if I had just gone and say, okay, you buy a ticket, you book a hotel, you give me per diem. They look at exactly. that and they think that it's not worth it. So I think it's, um, it's very important. The struggle is real, but it's very important that from a personal point of view as journalists covering the African game, that we build relationships not just with administrators, as Asha stated, mm -hmm. um, but also even with corporate institutions. And we need to be very, very tactful in the way we deal with it. You look at what is it, who is interested in what. And mm -hmm. once we get to know that sort of information, then you can align your coverage towards those companies and what their interests are. Because targeted coverage is very important um, to securing sponsorship because the general coverage really doesn't work anymore. Everyone is doing the same thing. So you have to target the companies. What do they like more? What does this company, what, is it, what are they more interested in? And then you try and give them that sort of coverage. And if you can prove to them that you have that capacity, I think that you're one step um, better in, in your attempt to try and secure sponsorship. But it really isn't easy. But these are some of the pointers that I think that if you take into consideration, it might just help the situation get a little bit better, but it doesn't okay. get too much better. I think those are fantastic insights. Um, if I sum it up, basically having a good relationship with the clubs is a solution uh, for them to subsidize your trips. Um, easier to get sponsorship to cover a national football team games, for example, uh, making a good case towards corporate institutions to sponsor you and targeting your coverage. Lucia, we are going to take something. I'm going to time it 60 seconds maximum because after this, we're going to go to Ellen Ingo uh, to shift the topic to something else. Yeah, actually, I meant to say that uh, I'll, I'll be very brief. I'm not like Fenty, oh my God, is he lecturing or something? Anyway, um, fantastic uh, insight there that, uh, he, that he has given us on, on what to do. But I just have two things to say. One, um, it may not necessarily apply to me because like, you know, uh, super sport is basically sports. So it's very easy for them to uh, come up you know, with budgets and FIBA as well, because they own the tournament. So either way, I will have to go for the tournament. Um, but what I would like to advise uh, young, especially young and upcoming journalists, is that you have to target, and that's a very important word that Venture used, that you have to target and um, uh, try to build your own brand, you know, as a journalist. You have to be very unique from the rest of the pack because you can imagine, I remember Mustafa can tell us um, at the AFCON in Egypt, I remember the Senegalese press, there were, I don't know, 70 something people. And, and I looked at them and I'm thinking, wow, how are you even covering uh, exclusive content, you know, when all of you are literally there and you're in the same space, all of you are targeting to interview Sadio Mane. How do you uh, create unique content as a journalist? So 
that is something that uh, we have to do because if you look at us, you know, as journalists, okay, you're going to cover the AFCON, the games are live on TV, people are live tweeting the tournament, uh, Facebook live, even uh, the interviews, you know, are already there. So what exactly are you telling anyone uh, when you're covering such a tournament? Uh, it's the same thing, you know, for athletics and all the other uh, competitions. So you have to brand yourself as a journalist and, and be very, very specific about what you want. So, okay, the Olympics have been postponed to next summer, next August, you have one year to prepare. What kind of content can you prepare and start to work on, you know, so that you can get uh, sponsorship to go and cover such a big event. But as you know, us being Africans, we like to do things at the last minute. You know, you want to look for a sponsor in June next year, yet you can actually start now to prepare and to see how you can get to Japan. Uh, but also for me, uh, one thing that worked for me earlier, I remember as a young journalist, I used to get half of my salary and uh, travel to Kenya. Um, I think at that time, Mustafa was still in school. I mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I would, I, would, I would get onto a bus, can you imagine, for 15 hours and uh, go and cover a volleyball tournament or cricket or rugby in Nairobi. Um, but basically, I invested in myself. So that's one thing that I would also advise young journalists. Yeah. And even if you're not yeah. young, if you're old, no problem. Uh, just save up some money, slowly by slowly. Save, maybe you can set a certain target. Save $20 every week or $20 every month. By the time you get to next, uh, next, next summer, you know you're telling your boss, look, I have an air ticket uh, to Tokyo. So please, can you cover my accommodation and per diem? That way they will know that, look, we cannot disappoint this person because they have already uh, done something for themselves. So all together with our ventures ideas, I think uh, this is something that is very, very uh, possible. We just have to be strategic. That's the keyword, strategic and target uh, our coverage. Angela, I hope that's 60 seconds. <laughs> that was more, but that's fine. Um, so, um, um, that's Ellen. That's like 20 seconds in Ghana. <laughs> Ghana man time. So, um, Ellen, we are going to yes, change the, the topic totally. And one of my questions is, there seems to be a barrier, you know, in the coverage of African football happening in Francophone countries. And that, you know, the football that is happening in Anglophone countries, what opportunities are there to bridge that gap and provide a more uniform coverage of all African leagues? So I think that the reason why there's that gap in the first place is because of the lack of data we've been talking about. Because, I mean, I can see here and cover uh, or have information about the Eredivisie in the Netherlands or maybe the Spanish La Liga in five seconds, literally, I can know who scored, how many goals, I can know um, how many assists this player provided or the clean sheets and all of that. And so I can have contents in my newscasts or uh, if I report I'm doing, it basically with very little effort. So because there's no data, it's not so much a language barrier in my opinion. I think it's more that th this death in uh, data. So if you would want to bridge that gap between the two blocks, between French speaking Africa and English speaking Africa, then you would need to have um, invested in the media structure in the first place. So you would need to have all these things we've been talking about to have a better sports coverage, better coverage of competition. So if you have uh, media houses that are covering uh, local championships more. Uh, they have in-depth uh, uh, data available online. It's one of the ways that you can actually uh, have these two sectors, uh, um, you know, just really work in synergy because you can't cover something you don't know. And if you go online and you're unable to find information, um, data about the championships happening in the other blocks, there's no how you can actually talk about it. So it's it's really important that, you know, we have this uh, sports media that are more just focused on sports and then uh, getting all this data. But I think without data is something that's going to be really difficult to just, you know, to, to get done. Yeah. 
Um, while we wait for Angela to come, I want to say okay. something. Yeah. Um, Helen, you're just being very humble, I think, um, because ideally I thought that you're the perfect person to talk about this because you come from um, uh, a Duolingo country uh, in Cameroon. Mm -hmm. uh, but look here, the thing is, um, uh, I feel always that it's easy for Francophone journalists, especially, to try and learn English than it is for us Anglophone journalists to try and learn French. And it doesn't matter how many times we cover the Afghan tournament, we never learn. Every time, uh, because I'm sure Fencher said the same thing after Egypt, uh, when I think in the quarterfinals, there was, I don't know, two or three sp English speaking countries. And I'm sure he said, uh, you know what? Once I go back to Ghana, I'm going to learn French, you know? But I'm sure that he hasn't yet gone to Alliance Francaise in, in Accra to, to start learning this uh, <laughs> language. It is a big problem, seriously. If someone does not, <laughs> if someone does not understand Portuguese, it's not easy to cover uh, the Mozambican or the Angolan uh, leagues, even though, of course, we have a, a translation um, uh, option on Twitter. But Twitter mm -hmm. is not the only way you mm -hmm. can cover a league, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in, in Africa. So it's sometimes mm -hmm. we have to try to learn these languages, even because then, okay, you can do an interview with the player on WhatsApp or on Twitter mm -hmm. or on Instagram because you can mm -hmm. speak that language. It's not easy. Or even if you use Google Translate, mm -hmm. we we'll lose some of the meaning, you know, in, in that in that mm -hmm. interview. So we have to learn those languages. Helen, you're trying to be humble because you speak both yes. and English. No, but, but, Asha, but that's the This thing is the truth. African so journalists need to learn these languages. But isn't it, isn't it, and you made a good point when you said that you were sure Fentua hasn't taken up courses at Alliance Frances. Um, I, I can attest to the fact that, you know, in Ghana, for example, a lot of people, when I talk, they'll be like, oh, I want to learn French. Um, it's been more than five years that I've known many of them. And none of them have <laughs> seriously gone. To, so they procrastinate on this. Now, my point is, what if collectively, what if collectively there is uh, a myth, like there is um, that, you know, saying that, oh, we should be covering football from Francophone leagues or from Francophone national teams more. Um, so they say it with their mouths, but is it something that they really want to cover? And the, the question, uh, the reason I'm asking this question is because, for example, when I went to France to cover the FIFA Women's World Cup uh, 2019, we, women's football tournament in the world, it gathered 1.12 billion viewers uh, focused on the Black Stars, um, uh, the Black Stars too well, by, by the way. Um, there is, th there was also that, uh, you know, important factor that, you know, um, for example, as, as a reporter, as a traveling reporter who was even from my trip myself, um, and speaking both languages and, 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 you know, something that is happening in France, why didn't, uh, people, uh, corporate corporations or, um, uh, channels understand the value of a bilingual reporter going to France uh, funded herself um, and, you know, having access to Cameroon, having, uh, which is, uh, you know, um, from, and all of this, like, is there, is there, you know, a lack of, um, of desire to, to even get information from uh, football happening in French speaking countries? I mean, from the from the side of anglophones, but uh, conversely, I saw Cameroonian um, reporters and other reporters from uh, francophone African countries uh, in France, and they were covering everything. And uh, they were covering the uh, South African team, which is uh, anglophone, and they even asked, "Where is Ghana?" The problem here were um, reporters from francophone African countries. Countries are more interested in Anglophone um, football than Anglophone uh, African countries are interested in football happening in Francophone countries. What do you think, Ellen? Uh, it's not, I think 
basically what 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 would you do if you're a journalist you want something that makes news you want something that can attract an audience and so if there's news you're going to go there if there's something happening you want to um have that for your audience so it's not a problem of uh, no interest i think it's just being able to have that coverage done. I think that's the problem. So if you look at, if there's a language barrier, because just like you said, uh, perhaps they are more, uh, I don't even think that's the case because in the Francophone speaking countries, you have met quite a few journalists. We were in um, Doha uh, last year, we were quite a few of them who would rely on me because I could speak both French and English. And so I would translate mm -hmm. for them and then just facilitate this interview. So again, mm -hmm. I don't think it's a, it's, a, it's a barrier. I don't think language is the problem. Just like I said, Usha, I'm pretty sure that you had, I don't, I don't think you speak Spanish, but I think you've covered like La Liga. You have information on La Liga and you've had content that had to do with that. I don't think you speak Dutch either. But I may be wrong. I don't know. But if I am, correct me, please. So it's, that's not the problem. You don't have to learn French or English or Chinese or Japanese for those who will be going to Japan. Perhaps you won't, mm. you're tell, letting me know that I should start picking mm. uh, Japanese lessons and learn more than uh, Konnichiwa, which is the... Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so that's I, not I, the I think, Yes, I just so think... I it, think Mohamed wants yeah. to come in. It's Mish, not the language, yeah. like you said, Ellen. So what is Mish. it? Is it the um, um, enthusiasm? Yes, Mohamed. Yes. Yeah, I think I just want to build on what Ellen has said. Uh, it is important for us to think about trying to learn these two languages because Africa, two of the majority, I mean, two of the languages that are majority in, in, in Africa are is French and English, and that will definitely be a boost. But as a journalist, you have to have that appetite to get that mm. story, no matter what. And um, I remember when uh, we were, I'll just use uh, Doha as a reference because that's when I met Ellen and uh, Anise from Cote d'Ivoire. And every time I wanted to, 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 to try and get uh, a story from a, from a maybe Cote d'Ivoire athlete or Cameroon athlete, uh, I would pull Anise or I would pull Ellen. I'll, I'll tell her, come here, stand with me uh, in the media room or, uh, or the press conference area. And I would, I would ask the questions. And if he really needed translation for, uh, for English to French, she would do it. But whatever, he, if he understands the questions in English, because some of them can actually pick what you ask. Uh, but they would prefer to answer it in French because they'll be more expressive. So you just collect mm. that data and then you go to the, to the media room and sit with Helen or Anis and say, I need you to tra tra translate this for me. So that should not be a hindrance per se, but because Africa is Francophone, Anglophone majority of the countries, it's, it can be a, a plus if, if, if we pursue uh, uh, to learn those languages as well, mm. especially okay. in football. Great. So I'm going to follow up on this question with you, Mohammed Steele, and that will be the last question um, I'm regarding I'm the challenges. Angela. Then we, we can move on to opportunities so that we can uh, end this. On the very... Yes. Is it, is it working now? Uh, no, madam, you are breaking. Oh, yeah. wow. Okay, guys, am I still breaking? I can hear you loud and clear. Am I still breaking? Am I still breaking? Yeah, carry, uh, on, still, now. carry on now. We are wondering if you and Fentu are in the same country or same city. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, not, not the same city. He's in Accra. I am in Tema. So uh, it's, it's a motor way it's right away, exactly. let's say uh, one, <laughs> one, two hours away. Okay, so I think, I think now I'm not breaking. I can go ahead, right? Yeah. Perfect. So what I wanted to say, and um, that would be the last question on the challenges so that we can move to opportunities and we can close the webinar on a very positive note. Um, so the last question, on the challenges is, um, you know, we were talking about, you, you talked about developing the appetites to cover um, football that is outside, you know, um, your country or language scope. Um, you know, the, market, the marketability of African football league, uh, the most part of the continent are barely attractive. You can talk about, you know, the South African football league, uh, the Egyptian football league, 
uh, doing quite well. But, um, you know, do, do you sometimes find it challenging as a journalist to provide positive media coverage to encourage viewership? Because at the end of the day, the whole game of, you know, a sponsorship, getting better revenue, because uh, the situation with sport journalists in Africa is, is a bit sad, you know, it's, I wouldn't say that it's, um, it's uh, a profession where you, you can make good money. So it's all due to revenue. And do you think that it's challenging to provide positive media coverage that can encourage viewership and um, by extension also encourage you know, more sponsorship money to go into, into, the, into the game? Uh, yeah. This this is to me, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. I would say I would say uh, it is it is frustrating. Um, and ever since uh, I, I started reporting, um, uh, that was in 2015, I think. And allow me to use Kenya as a case example. Um, in general, for us to make sure football is uh, is uh, commercially viable for for sponsors and partners to come in, we have to make sure that the game is is loved by our own. Now at, at a national level, that is, yeah. Make sure the game is valued and it is appealing to your own uh, country before you even start thinking of selling it abroad. Uh, right. This is the case with with sub-Saharan countries, excluding uh, South Africa, of course. And if you, allow me to just go into the what I think is the problem mm-hmm. before we even take a look at what we can do to try and improve. Um, if you look at South Africa and the northern northern. Uh, countries i think the the top five leagues in terms of value are from northern africa and south africa we have morocco tunisia mm. algeria and i think top two is south africa and uh, and mm. egypt south africa mainly because of of you know they have super sport and it's and live live coverage of football plays a huge role in terms of marketing the game that is not denied and if you look at the northern african nations because of proximity to the Middle East and to Europe, they they can sell broadcasting mm-hmm. rights as well. As much as their leagues are not being watched sub-Sahara that much, but they are always airing mm-hmm. in, in their countries. And there's so much interest in, you know, the like, likes of Spain, France, where you'll find channels in TV stations in France and Spain also airing Moroccan games and Algerian games. Wow. Uh, same with mid with the Middle East, uh, being sports, being sports, I think, uh, Egyptian games as well. Um, aside from live football, uh, as journalists, because we're sports journalists, we, 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 we do the news beat and reporting and, and coming up with stories to try and narrate the game and try to, to, to sell the game. It's very difficult. Uh, it's a very difficult job if you have nothing much to say Positively, that is. Uh, a case example in Kenya in 2016, mm-hmm. I, I believe, or t- 2016 or early 2017, Supersport uh, terminated their contract as the live uh, broadcasting partner for Kenyan Premier League. And all of a sudden, Kenyan football was in the dark. I had just started uh, doing sports reporting just a year or two into my sports reporting. And all of a sudden, there's no football to, to watch and you have to go to a, a certain match and attend just one match where you have mm-hmm. 10 matches happening in a weekend mm-hmm. and you have a mm-hmm. sports show on the weekend, mm-hmm. a football show. So you're like, okay, so how are we going to, to you know, to, to move forward and, and, and sell this? And that, that's mm-hmm. when it hits uh, for, for, for our leagues and, and also federations. Mm-hmm. They have to be able to package um, uh, their leagues. Uh, make mm-hmm. sure you, you make it valuable. And this, this cuts across mm-hmm. from its... its uh, it's a responsibility of uh, journalists, it's a responsibility of the leagues, federation, even clubs as well. And in majority of the countries, I don't know if others will, uh, will agree also with me, is most of the clubs in, in, in these leagues, are majority of them are institutions or, or corporate companies where they don't have a huge fan base. Most people don't identify with, with the clubs, even though they, they do fund the clubs, limited sometimes, uh. just for them to go play matches, and, and, and pay the players and, and, and nothing much apart from that. They don't, they don't have merchandising. Uh, people cannot actually go and watch uh, Team A and Team B. Maybe it's a, it's a bank uh, team and another one is a postal, uh, the Kenya postal team maybe, for instance, where no one, no one really uh, identifies uh, with these clubs. 
obviously we have one or two which are maybe regional mm. or community based which really pull crowds and that is really good but you cannot only just depend on that to sell a whole league you get mm-hmm. and um mm. uh, i've noticed through my years that uh, both the the the, federa- uh, the federation leagues and even clubs tend to to feel so comfortable once they get one sponsor maybe a shirt sponsor mm. or a title sponsor and that's it if you look at many other leagues like the, the, the south african league and the north african leagues they have so many partners in the leagues not just they, they have a, they have a broadcast partner they have title sponsor they have other partners is be it banks be it insurance companies they 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 have monthly awards for players and coaches where they continue pulling you know uh, uh, sponsors from corporates um so i believe this should be should be uh, should be done more in in countries that are in sub saharan especially kenya east africa and west africa i mean uh, tahiru and asha i'm sure and helen mm. you you can also give your your points on how things are uh, in your countries um but now in terms of uh, packaging these games um th- this league let me just mention yes. the fact that yeah. uh, the kenyan premier league had a title sponsor i think between 2018 to 2017 mm-hmm. 2019 it was a betting company mm-hmm. the betting the betting company was the title sponsor but they had a newsroom they had a news setup okay just to be able to market the game exactly even though even though it was benefiting the league but for them they were doing it because it is their business mm. the, the business of betting the, the, the subscribers will have to will have to read will have to read more will have they provided stats they provided so many things but when they pulled out in 2019 the, the Kenyan Premier League had no title sponsor all of a sudden again no data no information because uh, the the betting company was not uh, involved anymore so anymore. that's a big question yeah, yeah that's that's wow. that's uh, that's that's uh, it's it, it is a big challenge for us as uh, journalists mm. but as much as as much as we can go and report we have to try and find ways to 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 hype up matches not just wait for mm. the 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 two fixtures uh, of uh, uh match derby for yeah. instance yeah in in mm. kenya for us to start hyping it you have to mm. you have to hype yeah. each and every match try and find the story in that match allow mm. me to give another example in the in the english premier league we have and this is a trend i've noticed in the past 2 3 years these days there's there's the title race there's a reporting that's done just for the title they hype the title race they hype the top four race for for champions league qualification these days they even hype europa league qualification race and of course relegation race sometimes you'll find a team like tottenham and manchester united facing each other in the past mm. it never used to be such a big game but they will try and find what can sell in this match No. Jose Mourinho Jose Mourinho is the coach of Tottenham he's the former Manchester United coach and he didn't live in such good terms let's try and hype this story around this so they find ways of hyping each match depending on the circumstance between of the, between those two teams and also they've they've kind of you know they sensationalize in a way uh in in terms of reporting how the title race is going so you end up watching you end up finding yourself watching a Sheffield United <laughs> against Uh, Aston Villa match because <laughs> the hype that has been built around it is is you cannot avoid you have to watch that I feel that's the same right. thing we need to try as journalists because this right. this is what we can do to try and find those those teams mm. maybe they come from a same region or maybe they uh, they uh, just before the window closed they signed their best player so try and create mm. hype around that and just make sure this match sells even mm. though people will not be able to go to the stadiums but people can try and watch Kenya recently signed a partnership with uh, mm. with a uh, with a broadcasting company from Spain La Liga even though they've struggled to find stations to 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 air them in, imagine they're struggling to find local stations that will pay to air the local league let alone outside Kenya So a lot of work mm-hmm. needs to be done still and for us journalists I feel we need to to try and find ways of uh, of creating hype in terms of you know uh, pre-match 
during the mm. match and after the match, how we do the reporting. We also have to try and find the story within the match or a story within a story. Uh, uh, what's unique about uh, a certain club? Do they have a super fan? Try and cover the super fans before a certain match. And then again, the, the point of data comes in and everything here is entangled. I was about to use the word entangled. But <laughs> uh, everything is... Uh, is, we are in uh, August. <laughs> it's okay. You can use it. Yes. <laughs> Everything. We are still in August. I'm just saying. Yeah. So, uh oh. So, if you're able to find data, if 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 it was easy for us to find data, even even the head to heads before a match, you can you can try and do a story. Who is the key player of this team? Who is the key player of this team? How many goals or or, or maybe defenders? You pair up a defender and a striker. But you can't even tell this defender how many successful tackles he's had this season because there's no data. So a lot of they these things, a lot of these things are really interrelated and they complement each other. And we can only try and do this as journalists uh, in terms of uh, in terms of trying to find sponsors. That, that's that's for the people at the top. But for us, we have to try and give the stories in a way that it can entice football fans because Africa has football fans. They just need to to be told, why is this an important match for you to watch? You get yeah. <laughs> so, and, and, so, yeah, and, so and, that, um, that's it. Uh, uh, 30, 30, seconds, 30 seconds for Tyro. I'm counting. And then 30 <laughs> seconds for Isher. And then we'll go to the next, uh, the next question. So uh, there we go, 30 seconds. Tyro, go. Yeah, you had, you had a I think he's changing his mind. He can't say that in 30 seconds. No, no, I have not changed my mind. I have not changed my mind. Listen, I, I just wanted to add to, uh, very quickly to what Mohammed said about the coverage, and you're saying that we have to find ways of making the, the game attractive. I think it's very important, and I've said this many times, that in order for our leagues to be successful and to become attractive to fans, to television, we need to create stars. Creating stars will come from the media. It doesn't come from the, the, the FA. It has to come from the media. And if we are not able to do that, it's impossible to get people who attach the teams and giving them reason to go and see the matches. The reason anybody would even sit down, because, I mean, look, the English Premier League, people would have us believe Jack Grealish is a superstar. You want to watch Aston Villa match for Jack Grealish? I mean, that's <laughs> the... That's that's the, the, the extent mm -hmm. to which we go the to create stars. Mm -hmm. And it is very important for us mm -hmm. and to create the stars. And this is a solution. I'm not sure a lot of journalists find a very lazy way of doing it because it's so much easier in Africa. It's so much easier for someone to call up a very noisy club administrator ahead of the mat and ask them, oh, what this Kotoko versus hat, you are uh, Kotoko's uh, PR, what do you make of the game? Who is he playing the match? So here we have a policy. We don't we don't call PROs, a public relations officer, to preview to talk to him about a game. He doesn't play the game. Let's talk to the players. Let's talk to the coaches. That's how you can do it. Get to know their stories, even if they don't speak English or they don't speak French. Speak to them in a language they understand. A show that will make them attractive. Here at City, we are the official. Um, uh, radio broadcast rights holders for the English Premier League. So we don't do the local league. But at the same time, we have created lots of local league specific shows that are doing That's so it. well. And what we did was TV, for example, we created a pigeon TV show where everybody is very comfortable mm -hmm. coming on the show. They don't have to be mm -hmm. afraid of the language. So you bring them on board, you talk about their family, mm -hmm. you have it. Yeah, Ole, please so, allow I mean, me to, to add let's face with the to, stars. To, 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 uh, let's package please. the games. African leagues don't know anything about packaging. It's We're packaging packaging in a is everything. Uh, packaging is everything. Infrastructure is everything. You can't see. You have television rights. You can broadcast a match. It doesn't mean that take the, the television. You had a comment. Community where the pitch looks like a gutter. Yes. It wouldn't but, work. But we got your point, but you were getting very 
very emotional so we're just going to let Ushara come in uh, make a quick comment okay and then we're going to yeah, let me to the topic <laughs> yes I mean the I, guy I, has the beam he's in the spirit sure yeah thank you thank you please please <laughs> so um mine is really um an addition and I just want to share something that um I once asked um uh, I'm sure most of you know Thomas Quenaite usually called TK who also yeah. sits on uh, on Soccer Africa on Supersport. Um, we once asked him about uh, the South African media, because even when you go on social media, on Twitter, Facebook, these guys cover the PSL like, you know, it's the best league in the world. And uh, he said that uh, when South Africa got independence in 1994, the South African media came together um, it's sort of like, you know, maybe if SWAG uh, in Ghana um, and, and also the Journalists Association in Cameroon, in Senegal and uh, in Kenya came together and said, look, guys, we're going to give 100 percent to covering local football, whether it works or not, we are all in. So they decided to go all the way. You know, South Africa, they have like, I don't know, 70 years of football. So you have people covering football all the way down. And, and, and uh, until the PSL. And even when it's the PSL, they're covering in depth. They know whose brother is playing in what team. And those are the human interest stories that uh, uh, you know Mohammed and Fentu are talking about, that we have to look for those unique stories. Um, if you come and tell me that uh, uh, Canon uh, Yaounde or I don't know, Dwala Wat, to one so what i don't care about these teams but if you tell me that there's this player who grew up idolizing samuel eto and is now being um talked about by rigo bat song as the player who is going to even be better than samuel eto now i'm listening you know um that's something that i want to hear that's something i want to to to, to learn yes about but are we to put in pressure on the player sorry uh, no 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 is it, is no. Case where oh, media sometimes Angela. put pressure on, on, the, on the players and then the players Angela, have you, perform. you met the English media? Like, excuse me, <laughs> who the heck is just English? Exactly. Oh my God. Guys, know. come on. I know. You know? I know. So, so that, <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. That, um, <laughs> exactly. Those and are the, the stories. The English media, the English media. <laughs> Yes, Angela, those are the stories that we but the need English to tell. Media have been creating putting pressure on them. Well, it's it's good for the players. They're not complaining because at the end of the day, when their prices are at 120 million pounds, they're not complaining when they're getting the money. So I'm not saying that um, blow it out of proportion, but can you imagine mm -hmm. if Senegalese media had reported and told the world about Sadio Mane? Okay, and told us about Sadio right. Mane at seven years old. Mm. Okay, his price would be 300 million pounds. Well, yeah, because can you imagine exactly. that and he, he would, Nicola he have won the Ballon yeah. d'Or? Exactly, Nicola Pep is more expensive than Sadio Mane and Mohamed Salah. What, how is that even possible? You know, possible. so. so Yes, these are some of the things that we as African journalists, honestly speaking, Should be we doing. have to tell these stories. We have to intentionally look at the content that we are trying to prepare. There's a journalist mm -hmm. who contacted me from Daily Mail who wanted to travel to Abidjan and do a mm -hmm. follow-up story about Sheikh Tiote, okay? And he's been planning this story for about three years. Can you imagine three years? Yeah. And I'm sure that when that story comes out, it's going to be massive. Now, I'm not saying that Ivorian journalists have not covered him, but these are some of the things that um, Helen, I, I once told a Cameroonian journalist that I will not say uh, the name, that you come from a legendary country of football. You know, if you come from Cameroon, Senegal, Ghana, Nigeria, Egypt, are you kidding me? You should be producing crazy content because you guys have world superstars, players mm. that play on the international scene. So for me, if you say Asamoah Jan uh, played tennis, ah, really? Asamoah Jan is playing tennis, you know? I'll be so amazed, you know, like really a story. Just do a story about him. Okay, he's putting it on his Instagram, but not all of us are following him, you know? So these are some of the exactly. stories that uh, Africa is yearning for and you have to think outside the box. You have no luxury.
I agree. So now I'm going to Angela, the, the, Angela, the just one, one more thing. Uh, no, one more thing is important, Angela. Um, uh, 10 seconds because uh, Mustafa Saab will want to do the word. Okay, I just want, I just want to mention uh, the, 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 the African Cup of Nations last year was played during the summer. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, was, exactly. that was a boost in terms, of, in terms of broadcast because even BBC were covering the African Cup of Nations in 13 different languages. So imagine us mm. as, as uh, mm. uh, reporters, sports journalists, uh, we're there in Egypt covering and uh, when a match against, let's say Senegal against uh, Kenya ends and the, the guy who will go to the post-match uh, conference is the goal scorer, Sadio Mane. We shouldn't leave it at that. Let's try and find that breakout star who was playing behind Sadio Mane, mm -hmm. who maybe mm -hmm. this is his first outing for Senegal in, in, a, in a major tournament. Try and follow up on his All story. Right. Because maybe there's a guy in England watching and they want to know more about this guy. They search on the internet and they find nothing. We keep writing stories about maybe mm -hmm. Mane or Edith Saguay. And Lekip has written so, written so much, the Daily Mail stars. has written so much yes. about Sadio Mane that they can they can actually read, but they don't know about the guy who was playing mm. fullback, I who was a young point. guy. Yeah, so it's really important to mm. try and got it. We try and yeah, absolutely. Uh, Mustafa Saab, please uh, come in with your comments, and then yes. we move to uh, the next uh, question. Thank you very much, uh, Angela. So I just wanna uh, put just a, a comment about what Mohammed was saying about the uh, the coverage actually, because as he's saying, uh, the last uh, African Cup was even covered by BBC. So, you know, in several languages, but where we're having the problem right now um, in most countries is for example, when wh whenever the package of the price uh, is asked by the global organization, right? Normally national TV, are the only ones that have the, the money to buy those rights. And, and they left, mm -hmm. they, they, they would be, they leave the, uh, the private sector like without no option to get, to, to get that right. For example, if, if, they, if they buy the, the rights about like, for example, $500,000, they would want to go and, and, and sell it at the same price to a, to a private television that want to covering just like following only the, the Senegalese national teams. And that Senegalese national teams will end up maybe on a quarter on a kind of final. And after we'll lose just, you know, $500,000 for, uh, for, for getting just, you know, the coverage of the African Cups, but just following one teams. So, and I, uh, that's where I want to ask a questions um, to, uh, to Mohammed and uh, uh, Mr. Fintuo. Is that right? How I sell, sell your name, sir? I'll take it. Yeah. So my, my question is like, like listening to you, you two guys talking about coverage, media coverage, like how we can like give a value to our, the, the content that we're giving, for how we can be together and just like making sure, for example, the African cup is like we, we, the African continent, we are 45 countries, right? And I think the African cups should be like be more popular even than the Premier League or in the champ cha champ championship, champions, uh, the championship. So how we can like tackle that, that problem that mostly we having in our countries, like especially in Senegal, where for example, whatever come up, like because the, the, the national TV is, is managed by the, by the government and they have money and the private, the private uh, media uh, company, they struggling to even have the right to publish the African uh, Cup or even the national leagues. So what do you think about that? What, what should be uh, the main solution on just making that uh, media coverage uh, uh, about the most uh, popular events uh, in, in Africa, which is the African Cup? Thank you. Mm. So, Tahiru, Tahiru, you can yeah. go ahead, Tahiru. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Listen, I, um, Mustafa, that's a very, it's a very interesting question, mostly because um, I wish that was only um, a media-related question, 
is such that this is this question and the way and where we find ourselves and our media coverage, I think is just a subset of a bigger problem that we have on the African continent. And we are talking access to travel. Ease of transportation is one of them. So the reason you would not find Senegalese journalists coming to Ghana is because to come from Senegal to Ghana, you may have to take a flight to France and then from France back to Ghana. It's, that is not the way to travel. So that is a big problem. If you want to go by road, the borders, the immigration people are going to frustrate you so much. By the time you get there, you've forgotten why you, you, you were going there in the first place. So these are, and then, so that's one, ease of transportation. Two, I'm looking at the issue of economics. So you look at the African leagues and you look at the media companies that we have. And I think that's what some people don't think about. Mustafa, when you mentioned that we are so big as an African continent and yet our competition is not as big as uh, the other competitions, that's also because we are a big continent, but we are not as rich as the other smaller countries. And like it or not, a lot of this has to do with money. So for example, if you are here in Africa, let's look at the size of the media companies that we have. Apart from the state, one, the state run ones that you mentioned, Helen Wex for one of them, or a, a big one from South Africa, like Super Sports, for example. You look at private media in Ghana and Angela would tell you how many of them actually have money, $500,000, to count to mm -hmm. go and buy media rights. It's impossible mm -hmm. because once they come and they set up the media house, they're looking at how to make quick profit. So that's one of our biggest problems. And to make mm -hmm. quick profit, investing in football rights may not be the way to do it. So mm -hmm. I'll tell you what the way to do it is. And that's what happened last year okay. uh, during the Cup of Nations here in Ghana. And that's how I think a lot of other countries can, 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 can learn from. So once the state media had the rights, they formed the conglomerates. And they say that, okay, the rights are worth $500,000. All the other smaller media, so that's the thing, don't be greedy. So all the other smaller media houses, you come on board and this is what we would do. We will give you the rights, but you pay, okay, if the rights cost 500,000 and we get 10 radio stations or 10 TV stations for the rights, that's 50,000 each less shared. And then if you take, the 50,000, I mean, that is more affordable mm -hmm. for a lot of the media houses to be able to pay. Mm. So that was what mm. they did. You get 10 media houses to pay 50,000. You get the money together. You pay the rights. And you distribute to all 10. So that gives you more accessibility. Uh, language options as well because it becomes a big thing and the more people have access to a product the better it is for you and what they did was maybe selling the adverts at the highest level from the state's level from the the, the original right owner's level you can play those localized adverts so you can go for your own localized adverts to try and upset that debt but if you get enough sponsorship from the conglomerate sponsorship uh, or for, from the conglomerates, then you can share that revenue among the other stations. So that's what they do, because then if 10 different stations are airing it and you're going to a telecommunications company to come and sponsor the coverage from the conglomerate level, you are going to get so much more money just by telling them that this advert you're giving me is going to play on 10 different TV stations. So instead of you, but if you take it for yourself, you may not get as much money. So this is the situation, I think. The coverage, because they don't have a lot of money, media companies are only running on for-profit basis, private media, not so rich because they're not from the richest countries. I think it's important for the state companies that get the rights not to get greedy and be willing to distribute the rights, share it uh, to all the other smaller media houses. And then that way, it gives a lot more people access to the games mm. and then you can spread the adverts across. I think that is a very good way for us to go. Um, All right.
So less competition, yeah. more collaboration. Among well, the less leaders. competition, more collaboration, yes. Okay, great. So guys, um, I think we are nearing the end. Um, we have like two, three more questions, but we wouldn't have time for all of them. So I'm going to take one last question, which we can all chip into, and we will be able to end this uh, before 1.30 GMT, which will uh, close a full cycle of two vibrant hours of discussing football, uh, media coverage, challenges, and opportunities. Oh. And um, here is a big point, which is a big opportunity for African media to be out there in the world. And there it is. You know, there is a demand in the Western media uh, for African football content. I think one of you mentioned that Daily Mail, I think it was Usher, who said years, uh, across three years on, on African footballers. So there is definitely a demand in the Western media for African football content uh, to be sourced straight from Africa by African journalists uh, who know it best. Uh, but then whilst it's an opportunity, we want to make sure that we're doing it right. So how can the harvesting and distribution of African football content be packaged in a way that you know, can be win-win for all involved, that is for the image of African football you know, uh, in Europe or in the West, it could be in the US or even in Asia, um, for the professional reporters to also get their share uh, whether it's uh, photojournalists, uh, whether it's uh, uh, you know data collectors, and also for the Western media and Western sports data agencies who are on the lookout for valuable African content, how do you think uh, African journalists can look into that opportunity, tap into that opportunity uh, to make it a win-win? The demand for Western media content, uh, Western media, um, uh, you know, African football in the Western media. Sorry. So I'll go with Ellen first, then Fentuo, then Mohammed, and then we'll finish with Usha. Ellen. Yeah, so I think one of the ways to do that would be to invest in data. I think that's the best thing because when we talk about, um, you know, quality reporting on sports, on providing that content and making it, um, you know, attractive to Western media who obviously tend to like to look at these players because most of them end up in the European leagues, the ones that are, are really good anyway, which is also a loss because, you know, when you have these really good players and they make barely a season or two max in, in, in the local championships, it's this drain that makes the championships difficult to sell in the first place. But anyway, mm -hmm. if you do want to sell uh, your players, then um, your leagues, your, 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 your competitions, it will be important that you're the whole packaging we're talking about. And therein lies like this really huge, generally untapped potential because we have like, there's just so much going on here that nobody gets to hear about. It's about all these um, stories we were talking about. So if we had, for example, you know, some company, I think Usha mentioned something like that, that uh, about one of the companies that was selling uh, data, I may be mistaken, I'm not too sure, but yes, if you have some, some a tech company that comes up, you know, and starts to collect this data to be able to sell to media houses. It could even be something that came up from the from a media house, for example, and you have this collaboration, you're like, okay, I need to know um, all the things that we've talked about, like uh, all the players playing in the league, because that's crazy. The, it, right now, for example, in Cameroon, we've had this problem. You're not too sure uh, who plays in what team, because maybe two or three months down the line, they've moved to another team, and there's something wrong with their administrative papers, and it's all crazy. So you're not too sure what's happening, but if you have an organized championship in the first place, an organized league that is able to package itself. And then you have the selling adverts, you know, I don't remember the last time you had, you know, like just this really something marketable, something beautiful to watch with sound effects and all the pump, you know, talking about this match that is coming up and pitting one or two old giants, for example, that come to clash and all of that. So if you don't have that, it's just some, it's, it's a problem. It's not just one thing. That's, that's, I think that's why it's been really difficult to just have it come together, but there is mm. great uh, untapped potential. And I believe it is in the, at this moment, lack of data. If there's somebody who can be able to mine this, it's something that will 
just go from there and affect all yeah all 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 aspects of local football in Africa. That's what I think. I I think this is a great contribution, Ellen. Definitely investing in data collection, research, and mining. Although this would also be a topic for probably a future um, discussion because, like you said, it will also create um, an opportunity for for the West to. Uh, to harvest talent in Africa, and this would be also another problem for Africa to, to um, keep its, uh, its talent. Uh, Fentuo, please, your opinion on how we can make it a win-win uh, deal to, um, you know, to sell African football content uh, in the Western media. Uh, you don't want Asha to talk? I'm talking too much. <laughs> uh, uh, everybody has a... <laughs> He's been a gentleman. <laughs> Everybody has one last thing to say. Uh, okay. I think we'll I, end with I, Asha I, because, yeah. Asha, you talked before me. How can we market Africa? Okay, so please data? unmute yourself, Asha. <laughs> unmute yourself and let's let's yeah. get your opinion. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I really would like to agree with, uh, with what Helen said. And uh, usually, I mean... I think that yes, there's the issue of data. Um, we cannot run away from it, but I am I think on uh, human interest stories. And I say that because it's very easy for me to relate with um, a Cameroonian athlete or a Ghanaian boxer if it's coming from a human interest story. Why? Because I don't have the context yeah, that comes with data, yeah. you know, um, because uh, Fentuo, mute yourself. <laughs> yeah, yes. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't have uh, the context, you know, because if you come and say that, uh, okay, uh, this guy, he's, he's amazing. He's been a top scorer in Cameroon or in Ghana with 20 goals. I'll be like, really? In Uganda, we've had someone who has done 45 goals uh, in mm -hmm. the past, you know. Uh, in Zambia, they've had someone who scored 100 goals in one calendar year, you know, although it's still being contested and, and people are saying Lionel Messi's record is the one that stands, okay? Mm -hmm. um, but for me, really, it's, uh, it's that human interest. We need to tell the stories from that point human of view. Interest. But also, yes, but also from a global perspective, I think um, uh, perhaps I am a, a little bit uh, different from all of you because, okay, maybe I think uh, Mohammed, uh, but Helen, when you're reporting for CRTV, you're reporting Cameroonian news to Cameroonian people most of the time. Or um, even for Fentio, he's, he's reporting Ghanaian news for a Ghanaian audience. Um, but for me, maybe in the last three or so years, um, I've been covering uh, basketball and football to a global audience. So every time I think about the story, um, maybe I'm going to interview Adut Bulgak, who is the first uh, South Sudanese woman to play in the WNBA. I know how to tweak that story so that everyone can uh, be interested in a story like that, okay? Or um, there's uh, maybe two siblings in Egypt um, that are playing at the highest level, could be in the WNBA and in the NBA in the next two years. I know how to tweak that and, and make it a global story. But um, Sometimes, so if I'm reporting for a Ghanaian television, how, how can I do that? I want it to benefit the Ghanaian public because that's the relevance I need, but also I still need that story to be picked up by international media. It, it mm. calls for being uh, intentional. You have to plan. Mm. You know, sometimes uh, you watch news stories uh, and Mohammed, you know, because you, you work for a big company, you know that is broadcasting to the whole world. Sometimes you watch a story and you're like no way that is so flat you know you mm. need to take time to think about um, the audience that is going to watch that story because I don't care if you do 20 stories in a week but if you do one powerful story that is going to change the narrative forever no one will forget that because I don't even want to go into how long it took Sadiq Adams to do the untold God because from a Ghanaian perspective Angela and Fentio can you imagine that not many people maybe had ever done a story about Babayara. I, I, I'm even exactly. feeling, uh, you know, goosebumps right now, you know, because exactly. Babayara is a legend. 
and I, I have context because uh, you know Uganda played Ghana in the 1978 Afcon uh, final. So before that, you know, we've been trying to do a lot of uh, research on Ghanaian football and all of that, and it's so amazing. And even me, from a Ugandan perspective, so many stories that are not yet been told. Um, so I have my homework cut out, you know, but I have to plan. I've been spending, you know, the last three months doing research work, making notes, contacting people. It takes a lot of time. But also, as you know, we have the whole uh, problem that is uh, Fenty that he talked about. You have three reporters on one sports desk doing uh, social media, doing television, radio, website. It's crazy. But we have to pay the price. Limited time. Absolutely. Yeah, we have to do it 100%. You know, we cannot do 50-50. 50-50, you're busy watching your Sheffield and I don't know, Burnley. Um, I'm, I'm not saying don't watch English Premier League, but I'm saying that if you're, if you're going to do this, you have to give it 100% and it will be worth it. I promise you, I'm a big time Pan-Africanist and I know that this continent is beautiful. We have amazing talent and we, the media, have a role to play. And we, this is the time. We have to move. If you've ever felt like you're doing a good job, Trust me, you have a lot more to offer to this continent. Fantastic, definitely. So basically invest in massive research to produce uh, stories that can be, you know, uh, put in, ar in archives. Um, Mohammed, uh, we've seen that Fentua has changed his background. Um, we are going to take uh, a comment from Mohammed and then we will end it with Fentua. Uh, probably Mr. Mustafa Sal would like to also chip in, but first I'm going to take, give the microphone to Mohammed. All right, uh, maybe I can mention two things uh, to close. I'll, I'll try and do it real quick. Uh, to build on what Asha has said, we should, uh, we should try and, um, this is in terms, is, is in term, in terms of continent, uh, selling the continent. Mm -hmm. We need to Africanize every story possible, Africanize. whether it comes from Africa or even abroad when we watch football in, in, in Europe, we should not leave out anything that we know we can Africanize. Like, for instance, if Salah and Mane were the first Egyptian and uh, Senegalese to win the English Premier League, go big on that. Do stories from Egypt. Find people who are trying to take the same route as Salah. How has it um, motivated people and inspired people, uh, other footballers? To, to try and follow the African captain to lift the FA Cup. Try and go big on that. Don't just let it end there because sometimes I hear commentators saying these things and I want to go read more on these things, but they're not mentioned. The, I mean, you won't see Daily Mail talking about how he's the first African. We should be the ones trying to do that. See how he has inspired Gabon or even other African uh, footballers uh, to, to, to follow his, uh, his uh, uh, footsteps. Uh, in terms of uh, trying to also get more content, uh, there's something I've, there's a culture I, I wish us journalists also should uh, adopt. And this is something I learned. Uh, there's a fellow journalist I met in Doha as well. He's Ugandan, by the way. I think actually mm -hmm. you know him. His name is Darren Cheyune. Uh, very good guy. And there was a time I was trying to chase an interview with the Ugandan team. The, Halima Nakai and, and Chepte Gaze, but I was not getting access because I wanted to get an exclusive, not just meeting them after they've run. But when I was mm. following Cheyune, because Cheyune was, a, we were very close while we were there as well. And, and I just met him there and I followed him to the hotel and, and the way Cheyune was, the way he was with them, it's, it's, it's more of a friendly relationship than just reporter athlete relationship. You know, we need to try and develop this because I could see how warm they were to him. He was not even interested in doing any interview or anything. They, he was just there to, to receive them because they had just arrived and they were talking about family, home, stuff like that because Cheyune was with them from when they started, when they, when they just started their careers, especially Halima Nakai. So that's something I really loved. And, and I said, you know what, I need, to, I need to start doing this because you can't just approach people and say, hey, I'm a CG, CGTN reporter. I need to interview mm -hmm. how prepared you are about this and this. You need to start from the beginning, go to the training grounds, try and find these youngsters and, and create a rapport and good relationship with them. It really, really helps in the long run because in the end, you, you, you feel like you grow with them. 
and they appreciate you and you appreciate them, their talent, and they appreciate you for being a reporter. And, and by the time he's now a global star, he will never forget what, what hmm. you did for him from, from the very beginning. Anytime Mohammed, you want to I have, him and just Sorry, I have, I have to say something, Mohammed. Uh, first of all, it's a Ugandan yes. thing. Um, we're always nice. <laughs> <laughs> We're always nice people in Uganda. No, but I'm serious, really. Uh, but but also just to just to say that um, I just want because I don't know we don't have a South African here, so I'm speaking on their behalf. Uh, South Africans always do this, especially the football guys. They they cover football all the way from when players are eight years old. So when they grow with these players, okay, yeah. and, and um, Ghana, Cameroon, you're very lucky because you always have teams, girls and boys, uh, taking part at the under 17 level, at the under 20 level, under 23 when you go to the Olympics. So you grow with these players, you know, from an African football yeah. perspective. And uh, yeah, Fedjo yeah. and uh, Angela, congratulations, because today is the first, um, you're celebrating when uh, Ghana won the under 17 World Cup, even though we know your players were not under 17, but um, <laughs> Just that's another problem for another day. Mohammed. <laughs> <laughs> that's another problem for Mohammed, another sorry, day. I'm taking yes. your sign, but I'm really concluding. No, 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 no. it's okay. It's okay, yeah, it's okay. So it's okay. Just fine. to emphasize really, Mohammed, yeah? Um, mm. It's so important. And even for me personally, in my career, it's been so important because it's easy when you come from a young age with these, these players, these athletes. It's so easy because... Now you become their friends, you know. I, I have, yeah. uh, you know, a whole lineup of uh, athletes that I can write to them at midnight. If I need, I have a deadline, I need to check a fact. And, and I'm like, hey, yes. guys, you know, uh, can you clarify for me this? And they say, okay, no problem, yes. you know. Um, obviously, mm. they're supposed to be asleep at midnight. But if, if, it, if push comes to shove, um, we are, must create such relationships um, so that they are really our friends. It doesn't mean we cannot criticize them. Yeah. Because when we yeah. do, they'll understand. But we want, that, we yes, want to push out the, the positives well. anyway. Yeah. Yeah. They did not um, do the right mm. thing to be that level of respect as well. Mm. Um, yeah. from us as the journalists and the, and the players and athletes. It's so important. And Mohammed, thank you for bringing that up, really. Um, no problem. And I learned that from Uganda. So. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so basically, just, just to, 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 to uh, close, um, my, my reason for saying this is there's no better contact to have than the main athlete. You don't have to go to, to anyone else. You can, you, when you have that relationship with them, of course, it's good to have contacts for media liaisons for each team. But when you have the contact of the athlete, like Asha said, it's these soft stories that usually sell the positive things. They feel they, feel they can open up to you soft more when, when you start this relationship with them from a very young, when, when they started uh, their careers. And uh, it's easier for them to open up about you know, their personal life, maybe their trials and tribulations, how they, they, they had to tackle challenges and stuff like that. So yeah, that's, that's basically two points I wanted to close with. Mm. Great. Thank you so much. Um, um, I'm going to make a summary of all the wonderful things that you've said, guys. Uh, Fenchu, we are going to take, take your um, opinion in terms of the solutions we can, we can tap into to, um, to make uh, African football content, uh, you know, sellable uh, in, in the Western media and to make it a win-win situation. Uh, kindly unmute yourself and kindly unmute yourself. Um, you will have to unmute yourself, please. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it. Okay. Oops. Yes. Okay. Uh, sorry. Sorry about that. Um, listen. So Asha doesn't beat me up. I, I'm gonna keep this brief. And I think, um, you know, you guys have said a lot, but let me just say this, that I think it's important for us to focus on the positives. I think in Africa, we have the potential to over rely and over focus on the negatives. And that is something that has happened a lot in this country, in Ghana, it's everybody's focus on the corruption. And, and this is a narrative that we shouldn't be pushing. I'm not saying the issues don't exist, but we have to make a conscious effort to only focus on 
what is really important in the long run, what stories are more important. So if we do that, then I think we can always sell the positive stories. And I think the other thing we need to do is to start from the very beginning. We like to only write and cover people that have reached the very top. And by that time, mm. you know, too many people don't know their stories from the very beginning. Every instance, an African star would break out. Suddenly, everybody's scrambling for information, scrambling for information, and nobody can find anything. If we start now to create our stars now, and I should mention the fact that you know, in South Africa, they have football leagues going back to under 12. And you go to the UK, you read stories about a 12 year old doing wonders. You rarely see that in Africa. Nobody ever writes about the eight year old that is that has scored 50 goals in 12 matches. Nobody does it. Mm. You know, so it's important for us to be able to encourage our reporters to even cover the competition from this level. That way, by the time they become superstars, we would have helped in the, uh, in the course in creating them and that information. If anybody finds an article from any reporter today about Mohamed Salah from when he was 12 years old, you're going to be the one that every international media will be coming to to help tell the story. Mm. Because then you would have known him way before anybody else got to know him. But if you're not writing articles about him after he became a superstar, that is great. But at the same time, I mean, it's just not, it, it's, it's too late to date. Uh, it's too late mm-hmm. today for anybody to really begin to pay attention. So I think we need mm. to start telling the stories of our superstars from a very early age. It's not all of them that will turn out great, and that's fine. But in the end, once the bigger ones become the big stars that they are, then I think that that content that you told 10 years ago would all of a sudden become a very, very important article. And I remember during the Commonwealth Games, I wrote an article a year prior about this 18-year-old athlete from secondary school that was racking up some crazy times. Um, she became the only African to make the women's 100-meter final at the Commonwealth Games, Hoha <laughs> This fair colored, mm-hmm. tiny girl, nobody knew anything about it. I went to sleep at the, the, the time I woke up, my article had nearly 10,000 hits all of a sudden. An article that I wrote like a year ago and nobody paid attention. Everybody thought, okay, who is this girl? But all mm-hmm. of a sudden after she performed, then suddenly I'm getting all these calls and I'm getting all these tweets. I'm getting all these people reaching out to me. Who is that girl? Who is that girl? Suddenly that story became a big story 12 months later. So I think it's important yes. for us to Absolutely. tell the stories as early as possible. So mm, I, and, and, my, 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 I don't have a lot of time, so that would be my <laughs> that, that, That's a very good point made. And let me also add that photojournalism is very important because photos or videos yes. travel the internet. So yes. there was, remember, when Mbappe was... Um, you know, being hyped in the in the English, um, sorry, in the Spanish media to join Real Madrid. One of the images that made the traveled all over the, the the internet was his photo when he was a kid in his room with posters of Ronaldo in the background. And then there were other uh, there was other footage of him when he was about I think uh, eight or twelve years old. So, like you said, when you make friends with um, Uh, potential stars at a very early age and you are able to take footage of them and then at some point they just break out the person the the photojournalist who took that picture puts it on twitter i tell you what is going to have thousands if not hundreds of thousands of retweets so uh, that's that's just a point by the way i'm going to take comments from um the audience on facebook so we have a comment from uh, delali frank abute from ghana who said uh he was commenting earlier on on ventura's point about um, you know media houses having very very few uh, resources he said the challenge in Ghana is focusing on a single field in sports because the media houses expect you to work all departments um, another comment from Rexford Aka Amo I believe in from Ghana too uh, he said the old field is, and he's he's um, making that comment He's making that comment for you, Mohammed. He said, um, I really enjoyed the conversation. Wow, very educative. 
Mohammed made a good point on making everything African when you said Africanizing the coverage of uh, sports. I think Mustafa has to mute. Uh, which of the people have to mute themselves because I'm hearing myself uh, at your end. Um, and then we have another comment from ST Asante, also from Ghana. Uh, where are the people from all the countries? I look, I, it seems like Ghanaians are repping this more. Anyways, uh, ST Asante from Ghana saying, uh, Fentuo Tahiru is absolutely right. We usually praise Africans who are already superstars, but not when they started. Uh, this is true in any of the fields, same in business. Um, another comment from Tony Vigno, he said, amazing stuff. I think this coverage is crucial to the promotion of African sports because it would give fans a connection to what's happening in their backyard. I know more about F1, Formula One, than my local league simply because the information is everywhere I turn. People are naturally curious. Once they know, they want to learn more. Thanks for this. And he adds, this might sound radical, but if we stop funding state broadcasters, then it becomes a level playing field and the rewards go to those producing the best content. We essentially have monopolies with no incentives to be creative and compete. Um, I would like Ventual to, uh, and you sure, I saw you smiling, so I would like you sure and Ventual to make a quick um, comment on this, um, on this comment from Tony Vigno, who said that he believes you know, uh, we must stop funding state broadcasters uh, for it to become a level playing field and, uh, you know, rewarding uh, the stations with the best content. Uh, yes, Fenchua, do you have something to say about that? Yes. Okay, I think Usher can come in. Usher is uh, on your oh my God. Yeah. Sorry. I don't know what to say sorry. about uh, yeah. Ghanaian internet at this point. I'm sorry. Uh, well, yes, I <laughs> yes, uh, sound froze. Uh, I didn't hear you. Sorry. <laughs> what was the question? No, but I have to get in a word there because state media has. Yes, to please, be able Ellen. To mm. Yeah, please unmute yourself. Yeah. Yes. And go ahead. So that's a very valid point, you know, about state media, but there's a reason why there's state media in the first place. It's if you think about it as the state, I mean, BBC is state media, but it's doing good coverage, you know. So mm. it's more about having um, the uh, audiovisual revenue that comes in because everybody in Cameroon, for example, gets taxed because you need to contribute to state media. So if you have that um, um, revenue going to everybody, all the media outfits there, that works. And it's not necessarily having this, um, I mean, it's a good thing, but saying that to stop funding state media, it, there's a reason why it was created. And we have to remember that um, Africa is still following um, the model of development journalism. We're not yet there. We're not yet, um, we've not arrived at the so-called first world. So we need state media because at this point, we still have the role of development journalism, which can also be um, uh, transposed into sports journalism because it's the same thing. You're not just the um, mm. casual observer or just watching and not interfering. You're actually trying to help, um, which is why we're having this conversation in the first place because we need to contribute to build something. And by doing that, you've already stepped away from one of the basic tenets of Western journalism, which is do not be involved, be um, as uh, removed from the story as you can. Objective. Yes. yes. Okay, I think that's a good point. Uh, Usha, do you want to comment on that? Yes, um, obviously, uh, again, I'm going to speak one from a South African point of view because uh, I'll explain why. So in South Africa, um, obviously, Supersport have the, which is the top light uh, league in South Africa. Um, but SABC, which is um, uh, the national state broadcaster, usually has uh, good coverage of uh, at least a good fraction of the games, but also generally covering other games that are popular in South Africa, like rugby, cricket, um, track and field. Um, and, and for me, I think uh, that SABC and and uh, CRTV in Cameroon 
are the biggest state broadcasters uh, in Africa that are concentrating so much on uh, sports coverage. And as well as um, RTNS, I think in Senegal, and there's the one from Togo, I forget what it's called. Um, these four have, have tried to cover sports extensively you know, and uh, mm -hmm. I see the efforts that the journalists are trying to put in. But again, we go back to that whole idea that usually state broadcasters focus so much on the politics and the business stories, and they don't really give uh, sports uh, good enough, uh, you know, mm -hmm. resources to, to cover sports. But these four are really trying so much to, to do a good job. Um, in 2020, in the 21st century, the coverage of sports has, you know, to a bigger extent, moved away from traditional media. So it cannot just be about television and radio. We have to talk about sports, you know. For example, in Uganda, where I come from, um, Uganda has the youngest population in the world. So can you imagine that more than... 70% of Ugandans are below the age of 19. So it means that if you're talking about state television, no one has time for state television, okay? But if you create content, content you're going to put on WhatsApp, on Twitter, on Facebook, so many people are going to follow you and they will um, be attracted to the kind of content that you're producing. So yes, maybe you can try to reduce the funding for national broadcasters or not. Mm -hmm. The whole idea is that everything you do has to be on social media to attract the young generation. And there's a Ugandan sports uh, um, football club that has done that. It's called Vipers. They're going to play in the CAF Champions League in this next season that is going to start. And this is what they've done. The owner of the club has matched it directly to the school that he owns. So it means that for the last 10 years and for the next, I don't know, infinity, every young um, girl or boy who goes to this school ends up supporting this club. Okay, because in Uganda, we have a problem that almost 13 clubs, 13 out of the 16 are best in Kampala. So can you imagine okay. all these guys are fighting for the same target audience? So when they attach mm. to the young uh, boys and girls in this school, they have funds that are going to uh, be attracted to the club for their entire lifetime. So that's how they are creating a new brand. So again, the youth, Perfect. everything you do, state broadcaster or not, yes, mm. state broadcaster or not, you have to focus on your target audience, which is the youth. And depending on your country, obviously, if you're not Japan, you know, and Russia and all these countries, Germany, these countries that have the oldest population, you're definitely going to target the young ones who have access to social media and internet. Absolutely, absolutely brilliant ideas. Um, so we've reached the end of the show because we've been here for two hours. Like I said, we could have chatted for a whole day because it's so interactive. Uh, you guys are giving so many brilliant ideas, uh, making so many great points. Um, I'm going to take two more comments from social media and then we, uh, I'll give the floor to Mustafa Sal. Um, somebody called GB Ann said, what if we had big African football TV channels funded by government that would gather both Anglophone and Francophone journalists and consultants? I think this could help promote African football. Um, and then somebody else uh, called Edith, uh, great to see another woman out there. Uh, she said, that is the word look fans like us need to be enticed and of course engagement at, at the junior level uh, but anyways we've reached the end of the show um, I'm going to give the floor to um, to the founder of uh, Siren Sports and um, the, the, the founder you know the creator of this African Talk Sports uh, program um, like I said my name is Angela Kriya Asante aka Triple A uh, CEO at the Chamber for Tourism Industry Ghana and also um, an entrepreneur with a background in journalism. Uh, it's been a pleasure to host, uh, moderate this program. Um, we've had amazing points of views and great solutions, which have all been listed here um, in the document on my computer. So I'll be sharing it with, with all of you out there uh, later on. But please, Mustafa Saad, come in as we take the last word and wrap up this uh, two hour program. Thank you. Can I just say something to uh, Asha before we go? Yes. I know how to shut Asha up. 
the Uganda craze, they need proper beating from the Black Stars. They get that. She will not say a word again. I know it. <laughs> As you Yay. can imagine, the results of our last three encounters, please. Let's deal with facts and data, which is available right. on the okay. internet. Okay. Thank uh, you. Okay. okay, now you can talk. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Mustafa, All right. the floor thank is yours. You, uh, thank you very much to uh, for all of you guys uh, for this incredible session that you you have uh, made today, and for the powerful, rich, and educative um, messages. And I'm hundred percent sure all of these people who was watching it through our Facebook page today just had a really good takeaway messages and you have once again shown how important it is that the, the, the media coverage it is essential uh, not only particularly in in football and that was the I think for me that was the surprise today because I was looking at just to talk with only essentially on, on football but I heard like people like um, Asher you know who was you know oriented you know this topic to the Olympics movement, you know, and 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 Puntio also was going about like you know, you know, going in a global way, and that's what we need. And I think and that makes incredible decision. And uh, especially thank you to to Angela, Puntio, Ellen, Asher, Mohammed, and I I hope that we will have more opportunities uh, to have a webinar again like this, because this is what we need in Africa. And uh, thank you very much for an incredible session. And see you soon. Fantastic. On, on this last note, we might have at this, at this stage, we might have to create some kind of consultancy because all those brilliant ideas, definitely the, the government and Ministry of Youth and Sports in our respective countries, uh, we need to fish those ideas from, from our brains. So, um, so just something to think of uh, if Siren Sports can can uh, you know act as a kind of uh, a consultancy agency you know um, between the media and um, and the sports uh, entities. Thank yeah, you. We, we see them. Angela, we sit and we open. We open. We open to do any collaborations. And even like right now, you know what what we what we consider ourselves. We 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 are not like a Senegalese company. We are an African company. We're here just to, to, to contribute on the development of sports and in all mm -hmm. sector. So anybody have who have an idea, a project that that willing to work with us, you will be more than welcome to contact us and we will be happy also to work with it because the most important things is just to make Africa uh, greater and mm -hmm. can't do it alone because mm -hmm. together we are, we, are, we are more stronger. So thank you very much once again, and uh, see you next time. Next time. Bye. 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 Bye, bye everyone.